Pastor Appreciation Month. And many of you have filled out a little thank you card to John, and I want to present those to him this morning and just tell John how much we appreciate him and Mary. And you said John, you didn't say anything about Mary. <laughs> There wasn't four cards, it was Mary. Whether he knows it or not, it's a dual thing, John and Mary. <laughs> you have to thank her for putting up with you. Time, but we also appreciate Mary. I just said there'd be more cards. We, a lot of you filled out these cards and tell you how much you appreciate the pastor. And I just wanted to know that we love him and care about him. And if you didn't fill out one, be sure and tell him how much you appreciate what he does for us. Thank you. Job, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, before we get started, I just wanted to share with you, uh, somebody had asked me a very good question, what does a chunk of coal have to do with Jesus? So I just wanted to just share with you, all of us are really that cheap, nothing <coughs> chunk of coal that some people see no value in, but a diamond is made through the pressure and the refining, and Jesus sees in us a diamond. He doesn't see us as a chunk of coal, but thank God. He takes us as that ugly chunk of coal, and he makes us, through all the pressures and trials and struggles in our life, to become the diamond in his eyes. So Amen. thank you for that. Amen. I came home from school one day with a shiny old mind. Fighting was against the rules and it didn't matter why. When Dad got home, I told that story just like I rehearsed. And I stood there on those trembling knees waiting for the words. He said, Let me tell you the secret of my father's love. Yeah. 
Exactly. She paid five dollars more. Oh, so she only owes a dollar. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to continue our series in Second Corinthians when the going gets tough. I think that uh, defines a lot of what we go through as Christians as we live our lives. Not only do we have the world contend with, we got Satan to contend with, and he wants to destroy us, destroy our testimony, and so he's going to do everything uh, that he can. And Paul is going to share <coughs> with us about his personal life here in Second Corinthians of the pressures and the problems and the trials and the tribulations he goes through. And through some of his writings, we can glean how to better handle these situations and come out on top. As they say in the locker room, when the going gets tough, the tough get gets going. And uh, that's one of the things God wants us to get through, is get through it. Look before that, the joke today. Uh, Sally, <laughs> Sally had finally met her true love, her soulmate. And so she decided that uh, because she had, that she would make it easier on him because one of the things she loved was baked beans. But it always had an effect upon her. <laughs> so she didn't want to put her new husband through that, so she swore off the day before they got married never to eat any more baked beans. Well, she'd been married almost a year, and it was her birthday, and on her way home, her husband told her, please come home, and then we'll go out and celebrate your birthday, and so she said, okay, and on the way home, she stopped to get gas, and her car wouldn't start, and she tried again, and still wouldn't start, so she got some people to help push the car off the side, and she just determined she'd walk home and be a little late, but her husband would be okay with that, and so as she's walking home, she passes the restaurant there that is famous for their baked beans. And she smells that great aroma and says, man, it, it just won't hurt. I'll go ahead and uh, have some baked beans. And by the time I get home, the effects will have worn off. <laughs> so she goes in there. She has an order of baked beans. And they were so good that she had two more orders. Oh, no. And as she's walking home, the effects begin to work. And she feels like she's getting rid of them. And uh, she gets home and felt like, okay, now it'll be okay. And uh, she walks in the door. And the minute she does, her husband says to her, I've got a surprise for you for your birthday, and so I want to put a blindfold on you, and I, I'm going to lead you to the table and set you down, and his wife said, okay. And so he, he puts a blindfold on her, walks her into the dining room, and she sits down, and then the moment she sits down, the phone rings. And he says, baby, I've got to get this, so whatever you do, do not take the blindfold off her feet. She says, okay, honey, I promise I won't. So he walks out of the room and goes into the study where the phone is, and she can kind of hear the conversation a long way away, and suddenly she feels the effect of the baked beans coming back on. And so she leans over to her right cheek and raises the leg and lets it go. And it smelled like a garbage truck going by that just ran over her skunk. And it was so bad, she grabs her napkin and then begins to wave it to dissipate the smell. And as she's doing that, she feels another one coming on, so she leans over to the left, she raises the leg and lets another one go. Again, she begins to wave that off and feel like she got rid of it, and it just seems to keep going and going. And then the whole time as she's doing this, she's listening to the phone, makes sure her husband doesn't come back in. Finally, she hears what seems like to be a closing, and she's like, okay, so she finally gets able to control it. Her husband walks in and says, now, honey, you have not peaked, have you? No, honey, I promise you, you haven't. Take the blind. No, I haven't. He said, okay, good. Now take it off. And when she did, there stood her 12 best friends singing, <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and that's a true story, unfortunately. <laughs> No, no, it's bad. No, I'm just <laughs> Billy told me about it. He said that was a no. <laughs> Have you ever been misunderstood, misjudged, or felt like somebody uh, misunderstood your communication? I think we all face that dilemma in our lives. We say something and somebody takes it a whole different way than what we intended. They get hurt. They get upset. And it seems to ruin our relationship with them. 
find yourself getting entangled. The more you try to correct it, the more the right you try to do, the deeper it seems to get into a difficulty in that relationship. Paul is going to share with us how, as he dealt with the Corinthian church, he found himself enrolled in that same situation and circumstance. They misunderstood him. They misunderstood his heart and what he was saying and what he was wanting to do. And uh, then when he tried to correct it, when he tried to make better, it only seemed to make the matters worse. Call that a no-win situation. And Paul found himself in that, and he began to write to the Corinthian church as he wrote to the church. He gives us some insight of how he was trying to address this misunderstanding this miscommunication. One of the things I've learned is as we face people who misunderstand our communication, who misjudge us, I have found it's due to a lack of trust. When they quit trusting you, then they begin to misunderstand you. You see, when you trust somebody and love somebody, you don't take the words that they say in a wrong context because you know what's on their heart. But as you begin to question their love, as you begin to question their motives, then one of the things you begin to do is you begin to question what they're doing and what they're saying. And until that trust is built back up, it's difficult to handle those misunderstandings. If you're dealing with a person who has a heart of love and kindness and tenderness and forgiveness and grace, then it would be hard to understand how you can get a communication if you know the person's heart, but it's easy to do. And often I have found as a Christian that as I live my life, most people misunderstand my heart, therefore they misunderstand what I said and misunderstood what I did. And Paul is talking about that same thing. What happens as you live your life and suddenly you find yourself enrolled in this and you begin to have disappointment, you begin to see anger, you begin to see pain rise up, and you begin to see that this misunderstanding is destroying a relationship that you have. What do you do? Paul's going to give us some great insight into that. Understand this morning, all this should be followed by prayer or with prayer. But when you're in that no-win situation, when somebody misunderstood you, when somebody is taking your words and, and, and turning them around different than what they are, when they have misjudged your actions, what do you do? First thing Paul says to the Corinthian church is you explain yourself to them. For our boast is in this, the testimony of our conscience, that we have behaved in the simplicity of and godly sincerity, that word simplicity can translate into holiness. Not by earthly wisdom or earthly ways, but by the grace of God. Paul says, I want you to understand the first thing that I did as I looked at this confrontation I'm having with the Corinthian church, they misunderstood me, is one of the things I realized I have to do is I have to look within. <coughs> So often as we face people who are upset by what we said or done and, and misconstrued it or, or misjudged us, is we instantly want to rush in and defend ourselves. We, we want to go at them. And, and, and Paul says that's not the thing to do. The first thing to do is make sure your heart's right. Make sure you have not had ulterior motives. Make sure that you uh, were doing everything in an honesty and sincerity. I remember I had a roommate, and uh, he wanted to marry the girl I was interested in. And uh, I thought I'd just take care of it real quickly. So I got ahead of him, went to the girl, and began to talk to her, and tell him her what a bad character he was. A <laughs> roommate came to me and said, uh, you know, I, I asked this girl out. She said, well, after she talked to you, she wasn't going to have anything to do with me. What'd you do? Well, I didn't do anything, but I don't know what she's talking about. Now, wait a minute. He got a little upset, and I suddenly realized I had some ulterior motives there, didn't I? What I said was not really true and honest because I, I wanted to, to have the situation skewed. Paul says, I want you to understand something. When I came to you and corrected you, my heart was in the right place. You see, Paul 
was beginning to write letters to the Corinthian church because of their behavior, because of some things they were doing that were wrong according to the scriptures, because of their actions, their intent. And so he began to write the letter to them and telling them, you can't do this. If you call yourself Christians, you can't be involved in this. You can't be involved in that. And suddenly they're, they're hurt because Paul is rebuking them. I don't know about you, but anytime anybody tells me something's wrong with me, it's not easily taken in a in a syrupy way, is it? I've never had any truth said to me about some wrongs in me taken in a happy way. At first it comes across the, like taking cod liver or oil. It just doesn't go down well. None of you have had to take that, I take it. You had a good mother then. My mother always believed it's kind of like an apple a day, a spoon of cod liver oil a day. Well, ah. Kept a lot of things away. <laughs> so Paul came to terms first with himself. He wanted to make sure he had the right motives. He wanted to make sure that what he was doing was right in God's eyes. As you look at people who misunderstood you, as people who feel like you miscommunicated to them, or people who misjudged you, have you looked at yourself first? The other thing is... People you deal with, you feel like they've miscommunicated, you've taken something they said in the wrong way. And you're judging their motives. Are you doing it with a pure heart? Doing it in a godly way? When you are misunderstood, the first place to look is within your own heart, your own mind. Examine your lifestyle. Be honest and open, willing to face up to yourself. That's hard to do. Be honest with ourselves. My mom always said, be honest with yourself, be honest with God, and be honest with others. <clears throat> if you don't do the first two, you can't be honest with others, can you? You're not honest with God, with who you are and the type of heart you have. And then you're not honest with yourself as you look at <laughs> and you begin to say, you know, maybe I understand why they took it that way because uh, my motives have not been right. It's going to be hard to be honest with them with that because it's going to give them more grounds. But we've got to. Paul said, I acted in the way God wanted me to. I did this in the way that's scriptural. That's the question we got to answer. Is Are we doing it the way Jesus wants us to do it? Did we say it in the way that Jesus wanted to say it? Was our attitude the attitude that Christ would have? Paul oh, Claims in verse 12 uh, that he had a clear conscience with holiness and sincerity. Holiness being describes the life of a believer who separates himself from the ways of the world. <laughs> Paul says, I want you to know I separated myself. The world says I could do this, this, and this. But I didn't do it that way. I did it the way the Bible says. I separated myself from the worldly ways. And then he also said I did it with sincerity. I have no hypocrisy in me. I'm being honest with you. There's nothing about this that's a lie. Brothers, join in imitating me and keeping your eyes on those who walk according to the examples you have in us. Paul says, do what I do. I am so feel so sure that I'm right that I can give myself as an example. As you deal with miscommunications and misjudgments and misunderstandings. Can you say to those around you, watch me, and as I do it, you can do it because it's God's way? Or do you have to be guarded? <clears throat> Only if Paul then, after he looks at himself, you know, hon? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> no wonder somebody got the heat on. Well, it's, it's like winter. <laughs> <laughs> It's only 76 degrees in here, Maggie. Man, you're going to get along well in hell if you like God. <laughs> that's a first from you. That was pretty good. That's just cold. Because I'm sure of this, I want to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace with me. And I wanted to visit you then on the way to Macedonia and then on the way back from Macedonia. The misunderstanding with Paul was this. 
all the church, the church I'm coming to you. And, it, and, and because he didn't come, now they're upset with him. And I don't know why they wanted him to come. Because every time Paul has come, he's rebuked them. He, he's been harsh with them of their behavior, of their lifestyle. And then Paul's trying to write. He said, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on coming to you. And I'm going to come on my way to Macedonia and on my way back. And now they're mad because he's coming. That ever sound like a situation you've been in? Somebody, you told somebody you're going to do something, and they're mad because you didn't do it, and then you're going to try and do it, and they say, no, I don't want you doing it now. That's, that's the dilemma Paul finds himself in. He says, I, I wanted to come to you. And he says, I wasn't vacillating. It wasn't like yes, yes, and no, no. He said, there's something else that has arisen. But he says, first of all, I want you to understand that I've dealt with you in true sincerity and honesty. Now you've got to believe in me. When somebody doesn't trust you, that's kind of hard, isn't it? You, you stand there before them when they've lost a little bit of trust in you, and you say, no, now you've got to believe in me. Now you've got to know. You have your children, and you catch them in a lie. It's hard the next time to believe that same storyline that's before you because you're wondering, are they lying to me this time like they did the last time? Can I really trust them in this situation? That's what Paul is saying. He explained to them why he had planned to come to them, but he, he was not able to. And he, he is saying, I, I want you to understand my heart was right. I wanted to do this. But it didn't work out that way. Now it's up to you to receive what I have said to you and believe. And hear me, guys. We can have the right motives. We can have the right heart. We can do it all scripturally. <laughs> Just because we do when we explain ourselves to the other side doesn't mean they're going to receive it. Do you all agree with me? Yeah. Have you ever said, I'm sorry to somebody, and they say, who cares? They're so hurt, they're so bothered by what has taken place that the last thing they're going to do is forgive you for what you have done, even if you didn't do it. And we've got to understand that as we live our lives, our job is, first of all, to do be scriptural in what we're doing and explain ourselves. But if they do not receive our explanation, our hands are clean. Paul said, which is more important to you? I wanted to come, but God told me not to. God told me to go to another city and preach the gospel. He said, what's more important? That you get what you want or God gets what he wants. As we face these situations, the question we have to ask ourselves, is it more important I get my way or God gets his way? Is it more important I get even or I give God's forgiveness? Is it more important that I withhold my forgiveness or do what God wants and then forgive? Paul is saying you, you've got to understand something. Just as I have to do what scriptural, so do you guys as you receive what I'm saying to you. You've got to do what God wants you to do. Paul is following according to Jesus' example that he gave in Matthew chapter 18 as he was sharing with the disciples when you have an offense taking place. First thing you go to the people who offended you. The church went to Paul and said, you've offended us, you didn't do what you're supposed to do. And so Paul says, okay, let's talk about this offense. The Bible says if you have offended somebody or somebody's offended you, go to them. And try to make it right. One of our core scriptures of this church, because we do not want gossip, we do not want to have it in our church. It's not to say we're going to get rid of it, but we work hard at seeing that it's not here. Is this scripture? Because it's, it's like Rusty. If I'm, I'm here and Rusty comes to me and says, "You know, preacher, James and James said something about me, and I'm really mad at James." And I, I just want to talk to you about it. And I'm going to say to Rusty, well, I, as your pastor, I'd love to talk to you. But if you haven't talked to James first, there's nothing you and I have to say. Well, have you said it? No, no, but I want to talk to you, preacher. Well, I'm not going to talk to you. Because the Bible didn't say go to the preacher and make it right. The Bible didn't say go to your neighbors and make it right. It says go to the person who's offended you or whom you've offended and talk to them. And if they listen to you, the scripture says you have won them over. Hear me, the Bible says that if I go to anybody else in the person I've offended who or offended me, and I talk about it, I'm gossiping. Now everybody knows that gossip is a sin in here, right? 
Yeah. Two of you did? Okay. <laughs> we'll work on the rest of it. Hear me, guys. Anytime I talk about a problem I have with somebody else and I'm not dealing with that person with it, I have sinned against God in the Bible. The Bible specifically says go to that person. Now, if he doesn't listen, now I can get other people involved. If James, James won't listen to Rusty, and Rusty comes back and says, man, I tried talking to him, it's like a brick wall, preacher. What do I do? I said, okay, now then we're going to go to him, me and you and a couple other witnesses, we're going to sit down and talk to James, we're going to try and work it out. And if James still doesn't listen, it says take it to the church and treat him as you would. If he doesn't listen even then to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. That's the order that God requires of us as Christians. Guys, hear me. We should never get to the second and third level of that. Do you agree with me? As Christians, anytime we meet with somebody who's offended us or we've offended, one of the most important things is to make sure it goes no further that either we forgive them or they forgive us or we clean the slate. Now, guys, there's a lot of situations I've been in that I've said I'm sorry that I didn't do anything to be sorry for. But I didn't want to go into the second level. I was doing my part. Oh, but preacher, you don't understand what they've done to me. It doesn't matter. Think of a man who was arrested falsely. They drug him into the court. The people there in court sped on him, slapped him, hit him, then turned him over to the police force police force put a crown of thorns on his head, put a robe on him and mocked him as the king of the Jews. They slapped him, beat him, and then they lashed him 39 lashes on his back. And then they weren't done because they took him and put him on a wooden cross, drove stakes through his arms and his feet, and put a spear in his side. And he stood there on the cross and said, Father, forgive me. A man who had done no wrong Never allowed it to go to the second level. Even though he made no mistakes and it wasn't his fault, he still was willing to take the blame. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed the debt I could not pay. Jesus said, the same as I have done is what I want you to do. God, as we get to that first level, you may have been hurting previously. You may be going through such pain God knows that and understands that, but what he's asking of you is forgive. Let it go. Let me take an account. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will pay. If you do this, he says, you keep burning coals upon their head, not upon yours. A lot would rather have the wrath of God on them than on me, amen? So as Christians, as we face those dilemmas, be sure that you are the one instantly doing what is godly and right in that circumstance. When you ask situation, understand God is in control. I know we talked about this a little bit, but this is just a different angle. Surely as God is faithful, our word to you has always been yes and no. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. It is God who has established us. You realize this morning God has established you? You are who you are this morning. You are where you are because that's where God has put you. I want you to understand this morning that you are God's project. God is working on you because he chose you as a project. I got project horses. Those are horses who don't know anything. And what I'm hoping to do is teach them how to be good horses. I'm going to teach them how to have a rider on them and obey what that rider wants, to go left if that rider wants, to go right if that rider wants, to back up, go forward, do whatever that rider wants. I want them to learn to be obedient. You know what? God chose you, the scripture said, and made you a project. He wants to instruct you. He wants to work with you. He wants to make you. I read an article the other day that all of my horses are projects toward broken. That's what I'm developing me, but they got to be dead broke. 
It says to have a finished roping horse, you have to go behind the steer 2,500 times consistently. Wow. That's a lot of steers. I hope it doesn't take that many times for me to get it right with God. But you know what? Even if it did, you know what God would say? No problem. He said if it's 70 times 70, guess what? He's going to keep working with us. He's going to keep continuing to let us be his project. His hope is it doesn't take 2,500 times. He hopes you can learn it in 10. Or really one. But if you don't, guess what? He's never going to give up on you. He says, so therefore let your life live according to his yes and his no. In other words, whatever you do, make sure you got God's approval for it before you do it. And if you don't, don't do it. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad if I have pained you? Pain is part of the process of getting better in life. I know it doesn't sound good and enjoyable, but it's the truth. We have to go through pain. We have to go through pressures for God to improve us. There are times our presence calls pains to others, and there's times others cause pain to us. How many of you have some pain in the butt? <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. Amen. There are people that just they just bring grief, they bring drama, they bring difficulty with them. On the other hand, you may be one of those on my list. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, you may be a pain in somebody else's butt. You may be the one that they're trying to avoid to get away from. We want to avoid people who hurt us. Amen? In fact, we have a tendency to cut them off. The Bible says that's wrong. I thought of a great example. A year ago, I went to the dentist for my checkup. Probably was... Not really a yearly checkup. I guess it was a five year because I don't want to go to the dentist. <laughs> There's a lot of, I'll, I'll walk on coals of fire, but I'll avoid the dentist. And I've not had good experience with dentists because they hurt. And even when they get done, you're still hurting. You know, you got that jaw puffed out there and you can't drink or anything for a while. When you do it, just kind of dribbles down everywhere and gets all over you. And you know, you bite your tongue, you bite your cheek, and it's just, you know, it's like, I don't want to go there. And so as I'm there, the dentist says to me, John, everything's great, but oh, I don't want to hear that, but you've got a molar that we need to do a root canal on. He says, What do you want to do? When you, do you want to do it now? No, 